In this video, I'm going to try and give a brief history of Alexander III. First off, let's see where Alexander III reigns. So Alexander III reigned from 1881 to 1894. He takes over from his father, Alexander II, and he dies in 1894, and his son, Nicholas II, takes over and rules until the revolution in 1917. Alexander III, even though he's only ruling Russia for 13 years, has a profound impact on the country. And it's really important that we start this talk in 1881 because what happens in 1881 influences Alex and really shapes his reign because as you will know from the last video in 1881 Alexander II is assassinated by the people's will and in the fact that his father is assassinated obviously Alexander III is affected by this and he starts his reign off really trying to get a grip back on control of Russia. And Alexander III's reign really is about control and repression. And it's important that you remember that and you think about that. So as soon as Alexander III becomes Tsar in 1881, he immediately begins asserting control over Russia and really trying to get revenge for what happens in terms of the death of his father and trying to really force control back over Russia. And he does that really hand in hand with a new minister who he brings into government, Pobodonostev. And with Pobodonostev, they put through a series of measures that bring back control. Immediately, the statute of state security gives the government greater control right really in the first year of his reign. Secondly, he gets rid of the third section, the secret police, and he puts in a new, much more stronger, much more repressive secret police, the Okhrana. He also restricts education. So in 1884, with the university statute, he restricts the number of subjects and the number of people who can actually apply to go to university. Because he realises that educated people potentially provide opposition to him. And lastly, in 1890, with the Zemstvo Act, he reduces the independence of those new political bodies. So Alexander III is centralising power and controlling Russia in a far greater way than his father ever did so. Probably one of his most famous policies, though, was Russification. And Russification, if you really want to know and understand this, is about trying to make the country more Russian. You need to remember the fact that Russia at this time in the late 19th century was made up of lots of different ethnic groups, lots of different cultural groups. Although Russians were the majority, there were lots of other different cultures and ethnicities within the country. Alexander III's plan was to make all of them more Russian. And he did that in a number of ways. Firstly, he encouraged the, Greek or the Russian Orthodox Church. That was a slip up there. The Russian Orthodox Church. And that's why I chose this image here. This image is of a cathedral in Poland that the Russians force and change into a Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian language is enforced throughout the country and regional governments are restricted. And you can imagine how you would have felt if you were a different culture or a different ethnicity and now suddenly being forced to become Russian. Understandably, this led to resistance and understandably, this led to anger. Probably the group that were most targeted in this period, though, were the Jews. And Jews were particularly badly targeted and there were mass pogroms, um, which really are kind of like uh, rounding up and beating physically of Jewish people between 1881 and 1888. And there are lots of them throughout the Russian government, uh, Russian area at this time. All of those things combined lead to huge resistance and resistance is widespread to this policy. In 1888 alone, so in a single year, there were over 300 cases of resistance. Russification, on the one hand, arguably lets Alexander III exert more control and more power over Russian people. But on the other hand, it also creates an immense amount of anger and backlash. That's important to remember. At the same time that Alex is kind of controlling and repressing the country, the economy is being developed. And I chose this photo here because arguably this is the time of great railway expansion. Now, the economy 
was developed before by his father, Alexander II, but it continues in Alexander III's reign. And in Alexander II's reign, it begins with these two economic ministers. This is von Reutern on the left and Bunge on the right. And both of those really introduce early measures to improve the economy. So they introduce a peasants and a nobles land bank. So things have begun under Alexander II. But it's really under Alexander III and his economic ministers that the economy is focused on and pushed forward. Probably the most famous economic minister who worked under Alexander III was Vishnogradsky. And Vishnogradsky had a great vision for Russia and his vision was that um, they were going to massively really focus on tariffs and he focused on making sure that imports into the country were heavily restricted by increasing import tariffs. And he said really importantly, and this was one of his very famous quotes, we ourselves shall not eat, but we shall export. So shall we, we shall export vast amounts of products, even if it leads to deaths and starvation. And that actually came true. And in 1891 to 92, there is a great famine in Russia where a huge proportion of the population die from starvation. Vishnogradsky, as a result of that, is removed from power. And that leads to a new economic minister being brought in. And that new economic minister is Vitti. And Vitti really, again, tries to transform the economy. He introduces the gold standard, securing and stabilising the Russian ruble. He massively increases foreign investment and he leads to an explosion in railway production. So the economy, and you need to understand this, under Alexander III is really given a boost and a kickstart. Industrialization in Russia has begun. It's still in its infancy, but it has begun. This obviously has an impact on the people of Russia at this time. And really the big headline to understand with the Russian society during Alexander III's reign is that the middle class grow, but still remain very small. And that society is largely very similar in 1894 at the end of Alexander III's reign, really as, to, as it was in 1855 at the start of his father's reign. It was incredibly divided. So Russian society that was divided in 1855 remains so really 40 years later. And between 1861 and 1905, the number of nobles owning land actually does decrease. So lots of the nobles sell off their land to different people. But the nobility, which is that really small minority, remains incredibly powerful. And it's an ability that dominate the Zemstvo across the country. There is better education, despite the restrictions that Alexander III has put in. There are increased economic opportunities, and that gives birth to a small middle class. But as I've just said, that remains tiny. Some peasants do quite well, and you get this new class of peasants that's emerging, the kulaks, the richer peasants. But most peasants, as you can see in this photo here, remain incredibly poor and tied to the mere, unable to move anywhere at this time. Industrialisation does begin and as we saw on that previous slide the economy is given a boost. It creates a very small working class in cities like St Petersburg but living and working conditions for those working class people, the proletariat, were incredibly hard and grim. So let's end by thinking about Alexander III's legacy. And you can see this legacy just from this photo here. So Alexander III had a new statue revealed by Putin in the last few years. And you can understand why Putin wanted to put this statue up in Russia. Alexander III is kind of your archetypal Russian strongman. He didn't care about what he was doing. He cared about control, repression and authority. For him, he takes back control of Russia, and to him, you could arguably say he makes Russia great again. But that had a huge impact on the Russian people, and the Russian people are living under greater repression than they ever have before, 
And that is leading to an undercurrent of resistance and anger that is bubbling away. Alexander III keeps that resistance and anger under the surface with his repressive measures. But you will see when we get to the reign of Nicholas II, that bubbling resistance and anger really, really increases and goes beyond that.